Welcome to Sustainability Now, solutions to shape a world that works. Designed for everyone interested in responsible stewardship of the planet. Covering food, energy, housing, water, waste, health, economics, and consciousness. Welcome to your community, Sustainability Now, with your host, Scott Billy. Hi, everybody. I'm Scott Billy. Today, I'll be your host for Sustainability Now. And today, I'm joined by Dr. Doug Tallamy, a true champion of biodiversity, renowned entomologist, author, and professor at the University of Delaware. His groundbreaking research has shed light on the critical role of native plants in sustaining our local ecosystems. With over 40 years of experience, Doug has become a leading voice in the field of conservation biology. He's published more than 100 scientific papers and has several books, including Nature's Best Hope. In this episode, we'll dive into Dr. Talamy's research, his passion for conservation, and how each of us can play a role in preserving the natural world right in our own backyards. Welcome aboard, Doug. Oh, thank you, Scott. It's a pleasure to be here. Today, I really want to talk about uh, my idea of, of how we can, can stem the flow of, of uh, biodiversity from our human-dominated landscapes, the idea we call homegrown national park. Before we do that, though, let's let's talk about what this creature is. Um, it looks like a fecal sac that a bird has dropped. You know, when birds rear their young, they don't want their babies pooping in the nest, so the babies stick their rear up in the rear in the air and and uh, produce a fecal sac. The parents grab it and fly out from the nest and drop it. And this is what it looks like when it splats on a leaf. Uh, well, it's not a fecal sac; it's actually a spider. If you look up close, there are the legs, uh, and it's a bola spider. Female bola spider, who uh, at night actually does look like a spider. She hunts with a single strand of silk, one one sticky glob of glue at the end there. Um, you wouldn't think anything would fly in and get stuck on that, but they do. Moths fly in, get stuck on on her her uh, silky glob. She rolls them around, wraps them up in silk very quickly, and feeds on them. And when she catches enough moths, she has enough energy. She can create a an egg mass. That's what an egg mass looks like. It's it's a very fine won silk with the eggs in the middle, and that's how they overwinter. Uh, but she'll go hunting again, and if she continues to keep uh, catch moths, she'll make more than one egg mass. Well, why do moths fly into this little sticky glob here? It's not an accident. She's actually releasing the sex pheromone of particular species of moths. So the ones that fly in are males who think that she is a female moth. She's a female, but she's not a moth. Well, I was interested in which moths, the bola spiders at my house were catching. So I unwrapped those, those bodies that she would cut loose and find out it's the bronze cutworm. Uh, and I have bronze cutworm adults at my house because I've got bronze cutworm larvae at my house. And I've got bronze cutworms larvae because I've got goldenrod, which is their primary host plant. I also have this beautiful moth, a dot line white, because I've got oak trees, particularly white oaks, and because I don't rake the leaves away from underneath them. There's actually a dot line white cocoon in this, this pile of leaves here that you would never notice when you're raking. There it is right there. If you look up close, it blends right in. And this is one of the reasons we should leave the leaves on our property as much as we can because there's an awful lot of creatures that are living in those leaves. I also have the evening primrose moth because I planted evening primrose specifically to attract that moth. Uh, the moth did come. It spends the day with its head stuffed in the flowers. Sometimes it's crowded in there, but it is always very cute. I've got the uh, zebra swallowtail because I've got pawpaws. Again, we planted pawpaws at our house specifically to attract that beautiful butterfly. Uh, it would take me a long time to describe all the things that are now making a living uh, on our property because we put the plants back, but it would not take me very long to describe what's happening in a typical residential landscape like this. There is no goldenrod, so there are no uh, bronze cutworms, so there are no bowler spiders. There are no oak trees, so there's no dot line whites. There are no evening uh, primroses, so there's no evening primrose moths. There are no pawpaws, so there's no zebra swallowtail. Very little uh, can live on a typical residential landscape in this country, and there are 135 million acres of typical residential landscapes in the U.S. Uh, and that's why the... Uh, um, Headlines are pretty scary these days, like the insect apocalypse is here, talking about global insect decline. North America's lost 3 billion breeding birds in the last 50 years. That's a third of our, our bird population already gone. The earth has lost two thirds of its wildlife uh, since 1970. Terrible statistic. 
The UN says we're going to lose a million species to extinction in the next 20 years. 40% of the Earth's plants face extinction. Some really bad news. And that's why Elizabeth Colbert gets to write the sixth extinction, talking about the sixth great extinction event that this planet has ever experienced. It is underway. But this is the first one that has been caused by one of those species, and that happens to be us. Uh, so the news is so bad these days that uh, people are actually studying what our reactions uh, is to all of these, these uh, bad headlines. And one of the people who's studying that is Richard Hobbs. And he says that, you know, our reaction to bad news about biodiversity is very similar to the five stages of grief that we experience once we hear we have a terminal disease. There's denial. And there's certainly a lot of denial out there. A lot of people say, well, we don't have a problem at all. That's very easy to do. Anger. A lot of people get angry including me. Bargaining, what can we do to, to make it better? Depression, that's pretty easy to slip into. Then the final stage, stage five, is acceptance. And this is where I'm going to push back because acceptance is the same thing as giving up. Uh, and giving up is not an option, folks. It's, uh, nature's not optional. Uh, so we need a sixth stage. And, and I'm going to propose action, where we actually do something that will prevent this from happening any more than it's already happening. Now we do have national parks uh, that were established primarily to preserve uh, their beautiful scenery, their, their wonderful places. As a matter of fact, Teddy Roosevelt, who was instrumental in expanding the national park system says this, the establishment in the National Park Service is justified by considerations of good administration. So Teddy was, was patting himself on the back and he should have, of the value of natural beauty as a national asset and the effectiveness of outdoor life and recreation in the production of good citizenship. In other words, our parks and our preserves were created primarily because they're pretty places for us to play in. They were not created with conservation in mind. And that might be one of the reasons we only have 3.6% of the US in the national park system. Only 12% is federally protected, which means 88% is not. And what's happening in that 88% uh, is actually a appalling. You've heard some of these statistics. Every 30 seconds, a football field worth of America's natural areas disappears to development. Development, certainly the most oxymoronic word in all of ecology. 44 million acres of lawn these days. It's an area bigger than the size of New England. We have paved over an area larger than Ohio. And that statistic is more than 15 years old. So who knows how much it is now. 2 million acres of golf courses. That's an area larger than Rhode Island and Delaware combined, dedicated to golf. And people ask, well, why aren't the parks and the preserves that we have enough to sustain the biodiversity that humans need? Remember, it is biodiversity that keeps us alive on this planet. And there's several answers to that, but the most important one is that these, these parks are too small. When you take a large area like this uh, and shrink it down into a, a little park system, this is an exaggeration. You're taking large populations and shrinking them down to small or tiny populations. And that is the problem. Tiny populations are highly vulnerable to local extinction. Why? Because all populations fluctuate. In good times, they go up. Bad times, they go down. If you're a large population, this top line here, even in your down cycle, there's enough individuals that you can increase quickly when times get better. But if you're a tiny population, often in your down cycle, you hit zero. You blink out of your little habitat patch, uh, and unless you recolonize after that, which is very difficult these days because our parks and preserves are so isolated from each other, then you're permanently gone. That's called local extinction. And it turns out that um, studies all over the planet, and some of them quite long, 100 years in length, are telling us the same thing. The natural areas that we've left on the planet are not long enough to sustain the amount of nature that we need to produce the ecosystem services that keep us alive. Now we tend to use extinction as a metric of trouble, um, but uh, I, I don't think that's a good idea. That's like going to the doctor after you're dead. And it's not gonna, not gonna do much help. Um, I think we need to look instead at uh, as a signal of a problem when common species uh, become rare, when they, the, the abundance of species that are running our ecosystem starts to decrease. This, for example, is uh, a picture of uh, the American chestnut. It used to be the dominant tree from Maine all the way down to Georgia along the crest of the Appalachians. Um, it's not extinct, uh, but it was, it's, it's functionally extinct. It was uh, terminated uh, in, in large part by the chestnut blight 
Uh, and there are now a few sprouts out there, here, you know, here and there, but there's no longer performing the role in its ecosystem that it once did. So functional extinction. Same thing with the rusty patch bumblebee. Just a few years ago, it was one of those common bumblebees uh, on the planet. Um, it is now, if you find a rusty patch bumblebee, uh, it's it's big news. Not extinct, but there's so few of them, they're not performing their role that they used to, so it is functionally extinct. Same story for the, the beaver. You know, beavers uh, were common, very common uh, back in, when Europeans came to this country. They established the hydrology. They determined what the hydrology of the entire country was uh, by creating marshes and damming up uh, streams and rivers, keeping that water table very high. Uh, then they were largely trapped out. Now, the beavers are, you know, coming back in some places, but they're not nearly at the densities they used to be. Uh, and the hydrology of the entire country is changed because of it. So we're really talking about defaunation rather than extinction as being the problem, the reduction in the abundance of particularly common species. It's local. Think about the, the number of species that are in your yard right now compared to what was there before it was your yard. It's everywhere. Uh, and we tend not to even notice it, believe it or not. We don't notice it because of a phenomenon called shifting baseline. We tend to think that the way things were when we were children is the way they have always been and the way they ought to be. Uh, for example, none of us miss the passenger pigeon uh, because it was extinct before any of us were, were born. It used to be the most common, the most abundant uh, bird on the entire planet, but gone long ago. Uh, and that is true for a number of, of creatures. So shifting baseline means that we are losing the biodiversity that sustains us without even noticing it. What shall we do? Well, um, the good news is that that uh, even the highest levels of government are starting to notice this. The UN, for example, had a, a special um, uh, meeting in Montreal last year uh, to talk about what are we gonna do about the loss of biodiversity on this planet? But you know what the UN does, uh, they talk about making resolutions. Uh, and, and they talk very slowly. This was a headline from that meeting. Crucial negotiations to protect biodiversity are moving at a snail's pace. We are negotiating whether we're going to protect the stuff that keeps us alive on this planet. So I wish the UN luck. Uh, they can make a resolution, um, but I'm not sure it's going to make the difference. E.O. Wilson, a very famous uh, biologist, entomologist at Harvard. He died the day after Christmas two years ago. He was concerned about the loss of species throughout his entire career. And in 2016, he wrote this book, Half Earth, Our Planet's Fight for Life. And he had one simple message. If we're going to save life anywhere on planet Earth, we have to save nature. We have to save functioning ecosystems on at least half of the planet, or it's going to disappear everywhere. And that includes humans. And he spent most of the books, the book talking about the science that supports that very bold statement. And then he ended the book. He didn't spell, spend a lot of time telling us how we were going to save nature on half of planet Earth. Of course, to a conservation biologist, this sounds like a great idea. Uh, we'll just put half the Earth aside and all those things that are struggling can be in that half and we will be in the other half. Problem is half of terrestrial Earth is already in some form of agriculture and I don't see that changing. And we've got 8 billion people and the other half, along with all of our, our hardscape, our, our uh, roadways and airports and detritus. And we don't have a third half to put aside for nature. So how can we actually do this? Well, I think we can realize E.O. Wilson's dream of half earth, but we need a new approach to conservation to do that. We've got to give up the idea that humans and nature cannot coexist in the same place at the same time. Uh, what I want to argue uh, today is that not only is living with nature an option, it is now the only viable option that's left to us. In the past, of course, conservationists worked pretty much exclusively where there weren't a lot of people. We now need to turn that on its head and practice conservation where there are a lot of people because that's pretty much everywhere. So we're not just going to practice conservation here, we're going to practice it over here, uh, which means We've got to move beyond conservation. We've got to move into restoration. We've got to put nature back. And that means we've got to find ways for nature to thrive in human-dominated landscapes. Not hang on by a thread, but thrive. 
Fragmentation has been uh, noted as uh, one of the serious problems. We do have viable habitat out there, but they're tiny little places that are separated from each other. So the, the proposal is that we build biological corridors where we connect those, those places so the plants and animals can move back and forth between these viable habitats. Um, it sounds good and, and you know, it's certainly better than nothing. But remember, the viable habitats will still be small. They'll still be tiny, which means the populations will still be tiny. And when they fluctuate, they'll still uh, have the high probability of disappearing. So I think we need to go beyond building biological corridors uh, and build actual viable habitat outside of these parks and preserves. Uh, this is good. Uh, this is even better. So the lighter areas would be where our cities and our farms are, but we need to build viable habitat by putting the plants back where we humans live, where we work, where we play. In order to achieve that though, we need a new attitude about property rights. Remember the, the land outside of, of um, our parks is mostly privately owned. And we have this idea that we get to do whatever we want with our private property. Our little piece of the earth is ours and it's our right to do whatever we want. But remember, our yards are not like Las Vegas. What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. We all know that. But what happens on our yards does not stay on our yard. Um, our yards are part of local ecosystems. So whatever happens on our yard impacts that entire ecosystem. Let's just look at, at uh, our decisions about lawn and see how that impacts uh, the ecosystem function, the life around us. The amount of lawn we have is going to determine whether rain infiltrates when it rains hard or whether it leaves a stormwater runoff. It's going to determine how many pollutants we're adding to the watershed, how much nitrogen and phosphorus and herbicides and insecticides are leaving our yard and going into the local streams and rivers. It's also gonna determine how much carbon we are adding to the atmosphere on this, this space. Remember, every time you mow your yard, you're, you're pumping carbon into the air. It's gonna determine how well we're supporting pollinators or whether we're eliminating the resources that they actually need. The plants we put on our yard are gonna determine uh, how much carbon we're, we're storing on our property, how much we're pulling out that's what plants do. They build their tissues out of carbon that they pulled uh, out of the atmosphere as carbon dioxide. And then they also pump that carbon into the ground through their root systems. As a matter of fact, 40% of the carbon harnessed by plants is pumped into the ground for long-term storage. That only happens if you have the plants there. The plant choices we use for our yards are going to determine whether we're harboring ecological tumors like an invasive calorie pear or many of the other invasive ornamentals we have that then escape our yard and push out the native plants that actually are supporting our ecosystems. In fact, plant choice is going to determine whether we are creating a viable food web, whether the plants we have in our yards are going to support the insects that the birds need to, to feed themselves. In short, how we landscape is going to help determine how much life Earth can sustain. It's going to determine the carrying capacity of the planet. And that is an awesome responsibility. It's an awesome responsibility that most homeowners do not know they have. But it also creates a grassroots solution to the biodiversity crisis. Um, there's a lot of us out there and a lot of us own private property. So that can create an army that can address this issue if we get that message out. Most of the country is privately owned. 78% of the entire country is privately owned. 85.6% east of the Mississippi is privately owned. So collectively, property owners that are owning all that property are now the hope and the future of conservation. And I believe we can mobilize them if we get this message to them. Let's return to lawn. It is the low hanging fruit, the thing that we can manipulate the easiest and again, we've got 44 million acres of lawn nationwide. Um, and it's, it's uh, dedicated to an ecological deadscape. Why do we do that? Well, lawn is a status symbol. We're not going to give up our status symbols. We also need to display our Halloween decorations. But what if we cut the area of lawn in half? What if we, let's make the math simple. Let's say we've got 40 million acres of lawn and we cut that area in half by restoring 20 million of those acres, that's enough land to create a new, what I'm calling a new national park. We do it right at home, so we can call it Homegrown National Park. 
And it'll be big. It'll be bigger than the Adirondacks, plus Yellowstone, plus Yosemite, Grand Tetons, Canyonlands, Mount Rainier, North Cascades, Badlands National Park, Olympic National Park, Sequoia National Park, plus the Grand Canyon, plus Denali, which is huge, plus the Great Smoky Mountains. Add up all this park, still less than 20 million acres. So Homegrown National Park will be the biggest park in the country. I had this idea when I heard about that, that uh, uh, 40 million acres in lawn figure back in, I think it was 2006, something like that. I started talking about it in my, my talks, but it wasn't until I wrote Nature's Best Hope that I included an entire chapter about Homegrown National Park. Uh, so I talked about it, I wrote about it, but I didn't actually create Homegrown National Park. It wasn't until I met um, Michelle Alfandari who was a uh, licensed, licensing, had a licensing career, marketing career in Manhattan. Uh, and she saw one of my talks and said, you know, you're not reaching the, your target audience. You're not reaching the non-choir. And I said, uh, yeah, well, it's only the choir that invites me to give talks. And, you know, I knew that in order to reach that non-choir, you need to use social media and all kinds of, of uh, fancy communicating mechanisms these days. And I said, I don't do that. And she said, well, I do do that. Let's let's uh, team up and form a nonprofit uh, and get that message out. And that's what we've done. Uh, so we've created homegrownnationalpark.org. The object is that you join Homegrown National Park for free. Doesn't cost anything. You register your property on the map. So where it is. And then the amount of area you're going to start to be a good steward of. Maybe you really are going to cut your area of lawn in half. Maybe you're going to plant an oak tree. Maybe you're going to put an aster in a flower pot. Doesn't matter how small an area you're going to, to restore. But you put that area in the database and then your little piece of your county is going to light up. You get to see who else has joined uh, your the Homegrown National Park near where you live. And the object, of course, is to get the entire country to light up. So here are our existing uh, national parks. We want to turn this into this. That's the goal. So what are we asking? We really are asking people to reduce the area of lawn. Our yards are uh, have very important ecological roles, and lawn doesn't accomplish any of those. We're going to replace some of that lawn with uh, the native plants that do accomplish those important goals. We want to remove invasive species from our properties. Most people do have invasive plants on our prop on their property and they don't even know it. Uh, and if our properties are protecting any natural areas, we certainly wanna continue to do that. There are important ecological products associated with homegrown national park. And one is a significant increase in biodiversity. I'll give you some uh, good examples of that in a few minutes. Measurable reduction in invasive species. If everybody removed the invasive plants that are on just on their property, and we own 78% of the country in private property, we'd be 78% done. If we replace lawn with plants that actually do sequester carbon dioxide, pump it into the ground, there will be a significant drawdown of atmospheric CO2. So joining Homegrown National Park will actually help uh, fight climate change. And we're gonna start to create viable habitat outside of parks and preserves. Every bit of conservation we do outside of a park helps conservation inside that park. Important sociological products associated with homegrown national park. National awareness, not just of what the problem is, but what the solutions are and what our roles in those solutions are. We're trying to change the culture. We want people to recognize that nature's not optional. It's not just there for our entertainment. And it's something everybody needs, which means it's everybody's responsibility to sustaining it. We're trying to convert hope into action. Hope is good, but action is even better. And finally, we want to merge all of the existing conservation efforts uh, like Audubon and, and uh, National Wildlife Federation, Wild Ones, Land Conservancies, all over the country. We want to merge all of their conservation efforts onto a single map so that we have a good measure of the amount of area that is being conserved on private property. Remember, we've got the 30-30 initiative. We're going to save 30% of the U.S. by 2030, not unless we record conservation that's happening on private property. So those are the goals of Homegrown National Park. How are we doing? Well, last time I asked, uh, we had 34,000 members. We have uh, preserved 111,000 acres. Um, New Jersey is doing okay. Number three with 16,000 acres. You can look and see what your state, how your state ranks. 
Uh, so there's actually competition among states who's going to save the most land. There is urgency to enacting the homegrown national park solution, though. Uh, and remember that 135 million acres of residential landscape, big job. It's a big job. So we all need to get to work. And that means we all need to be on the same page about what we have to do. There are certain things we all have to be familiar with. And what we need to know is what our property should be doing. Four things. All properties should be supporting viable food webs, picking plants that actually pass on their energy so that you have uh, animals that can live on your property and then have a viable ecosystem. All properties need to sequester carbon to help climate change. All properties need, they all exist within a, a watershed. So we all need to manage that watershed responsibly. And all properties need to support pollinators. Uh, lawn, of course, accomplishes none of those goals, which is why we're focusing on lawn in the beginning. It's easy to reduce the area of lawn. We also have to learn how important plant choice is. In the past, we have chosen our plants with one thing in mind, and that is how pretty they are. Now we have to choose our plants with two things in mind. How pretty are they and how well do they function in our local ecosystems? Uh, and that means we've got to focus on native plants. There are three kinds of plants that are out there. Plants that contribute energy to local food webs. So plants are capturing energy from the sun, turning it into food through photosynthesis, and then passing it on uh, so that you have a, a viable uh, food web and a viable ecosystem. Those are the contributors. You also have non-contributors. Those are plants that capture energy, make food, but they don't pass it on. It stays within the plant. And then there are plants that actively remove energy from local ecosystems. Best example of a contributor would be one of the oaks. Across the country, uh, in 84% of the counties in which they occur, oaks uh, are transferring more energy uh, up the food web than any other plant genus. A good example of a non-contributor would be a ginkgo, ginkgo biloba from Asia. Nice ornamental plant. It's non-invasive, it's not moving around, but nothing eats a ginkgo. So it's there, but it's not contributing energy to your local food web. And a good example of a, a detractor would be any of the invasive ornamentals that escape our yards, push out the native plants uh, that uh, are contributing and replace it with a plant that's not. And a good example of that would be, be bamboo. We also need to, to, to appreciate how important caterpillars are in local food webs. Now they used to be, you know, as gardeners, they used to be our enemy, make sure you kill all the caterpillars. But it turns out that caterpillars are transferring more energy from plants to other animals than any other type of plant eater. So if we design landscapes that don't have a lot of caterpillars in them, we're going to have failed food webs and eventually failed ecosystems. Uh, and that is why uh, plants that I call keystone plants are essential because they are supporting more caterpillars than any other type of, of plant. Remember what a keystone is. It's a stone in the middle of the Roman arch. And if you take that stone out of the arch, the arch collapses. Well, it turns out that just 14% of our native plants are supporting 90% of the caterpillars that are out there. They're creating 90% of the caterpillar food that drives those food webs. Those are the keystone plants that I'm talking about. So think about the, the keystone plants and the ecological house that you're building as the two by fours that are gonna hold up that house. They're the support system. You cannot hold up that house without them. We can't build a house out of wallpaper. And that's what we've been trying to do for the last century. How do you find out what the keystone plants are where you live? You go to Native Plant Finder on the National Wildlife Federation website, put in your zip code and the ranked list of the most important uh, woody plant genera and herbaceous plant genera in your county will pop up. We also have to, to remember all those wonderful things that E.O. Wilson told us, like insects are the little things that run the world. And if they disappear, lots of very nasty things will happen. Uh, and we have to accept uh, that 90% that of those insects that are running the world, the ones that eat plants, um, are host plant specialists. They can only eat particular plants, the ones for which they have adaptations that allow them to get around the plant defenses. And that takes a long period of evolutionary history with those plants. And once they develop those adaptations, they are locked into eating that plant. Let's use the monarch butterfly as an example. Um, it, we, most people know that monarchs require milkweeds. They're beautiful butterflies. We want to save them. And they are host plant specialists on milkweeds. That is their only host plant. But milkweeds are toxic plants. How can monarchs eat toxic plants? 
that are protected by cardiac glycosides and also milky latex sap. When you break open a milkweed leaf, all this white goo comes out. If that gets on the mouth parts of a caterpillar, it dries and gums them up and glues their mouth shut. Well, it turns out that monarchs have the adaptations necessary to get around those plant defenses. They have specialized enzymes that store and excrete and detoxify those cardiac glycosides. They have behavioral adaptations that minimize uh, the caterpillar's exposure to the, the uh, sticky latex sap. Uh, and that is what allows the monarch to coexist with, uh, not just coexist, but to, to be able to utilize the nutrients that are in milkweeds. Remember, monarchs are not exceptions. 90% of the insects that eat plants are spe have specialized relationships with the plants they eat, just like the monarch. So if we take those plants away, we lose those insects. We also have to in internalize how important pollinators are. Uh, and I'm not just talking about the non-native honeybee. Uh, and we're, we're doing pretty well with this. We hear a lot about how we need uh, pollinators because they pollinate a third of our crops. Um, well, we need pollinators everywhere, not just in our crops. It's not a third of our crops. It's actually one twelfth of our crops. Uh, and I hear people say, I, I don't live next to a farm, so I don't need, I don't need any pollinators. I don't like the crop argument. Uh, we need pollinators because they're pollinating 80% of all plants and 90% of all flowering plants. If we lose our pollinators, we're going to lose 80 to 90% of the plants on the planet. And that simply is not an option. We want to realize how important leaves are. The fallen leaves in the fall, um, call them leaf litter. Uh, Jean Ponzi in, in uh, St. Louis suggests we call them leaf largesse because they do such important things. The nutrients that our trees used that previous year are locked up in these leaves. We have to return those nutrients to the ground so the tree can use it again. Uh, that means the leaves have to stay there until they decay. The nutrients are incorporated into the soil by all the organisms that live in the ground. There are more species that live uh, in the ground than above the ground. Most of them are what we call detritivores. They're eating these leaves, returning the nutrients to the soil. And then we got all the mycorrhizal fungal uh, associations that transfer those nutrients to the plants so they can use them again. When we rake leaves away, we're losing all of the, those ecosystem services. The leaves are also providing the moisture required by those soil organisms. When we rake leaves away, then the, the soil is bare. Uh, and dries out uh, and the soil community is is uh, killed. People worry, well, I can't keep the leaves on my, my I certainly can't keep them on my, my lawn. And if I put them in my flower beds, they're gonna prevent plants from, from growing, but they actually don't. And I'm not saying pile your leaves five feet thick, but uh, a normal layer of leaf litter allows those plants to get through just fine. Give it a chance. We have to appreciate uh, what our light pollution, the, the security lights we use at night, what's that doing to local biodiversity, particularly nocturnal insects? Light pollution is one of the major causes of insect declines at night because insects are attracted to these lights, they fly around and they die. But here's an easy solution. All we have to do is take the white bulbs out of our security lights and replace them with yellow bulbs. Uh, and if we do that, that's because nocturnal insects are far less attracted to yellow wavelengths. So if we replace our white bulbs with yellow bulbs, overnight we would save millions of insects. Uh, and if we use LA, yellow LED lights, we'd save millions of dollars as, as well. Mosquito fogging, it's another, another uh, scourge on the landscape. We've got to appreciate that um, there's a little false advertising going on here. First of all, the this is a booming business around the country. Everybody wants to control their mosquitoes with these fogging companies. Uh, and they say um, it's okay because it's a natural product that they're fogging. And it is a natural product. It's pyrethroids, uh, but it's, it's industrial strength pyrethroids. So it's pretty nasty stuff. Uh, and being natural doesn't mean much to me. Cyanide is natural. Ricin is natural. Nature produces some really nasty things. So... They also say it only kills mosquitoes, and that's not even close to, to true. Uh, it kills all of the pollinators we're trying to save there. It kills the monarchs. This is a result of a mosquito fogging operation on the uh, eastern shore of Maryland. Um, you, there's no way you can kill mosquitoes without killing all the other insects. The interesting thing is it does not control mosquitoes. So we're doing this for nothing. Actually, not for nothing. It costs a lot of money to do it. Um, it's very difficult to control mosquitoes in the adult stage. You have to kill 90% of them to control them in the adult stage. And these guys kill between 10 and 50%.
The real way to control mosquitoes is in the larval stage. And we can do it with biological control, a product called mosquito dunks. That's Bacillus thuringiensis that only kills aquatic diptera. So what you want to do is get the mosquitoes to lay their eggs in a bucket. Get the bucket and fill it full of water and pull it, put a, a handful of straw or hay in there and let it ferment in the, the sunlight for a few days. It'll build up populations of diatoms and algae, and that becomes an irresistible brew. That's what, that's what uh, mosquito larvae eat, diatoms and algae. So the female mosquitoes in your yard will lay their eggs in your bucket. Then you put, you go to the hardware store and get a sheet of mosquito dunks. That's $12 and put a mosquito dunk in your bucket. Um, again, it is a natural bacterium that only kills aquatic dipterin. And the only aquatic dipterin in your bucket is a mosquito larva. Uh, so it's targeted, it's cheap. And if everybody did it, it would help a lot. We should appreciate how important small properties are. You don't have to own uh, 30 acres in order to be an effective uh, part of the future of conservation. Uh, this is Pam Carlson's house in Chicago. It's a 10th of an acre, three times smaller than the average lot size. Uh, it's beautiful uh, because she has landscaped it with, with uh, native plants very attractively. And she's recorded 124 bird species that have used her yard since she put in these native plants. And that includes uh, people that don't even have properties at all. They can do container gardening. Um, I, you know, 82% of us live in, in cities right now. So that's a lot of people live in, in apartment complexes or places with uh, very, very tiny yards, but put in the right plants and they can be effective uh, sources of food for pollinators, for those migrating monarchs. Um, and, and if everybody did this again, it would turn those, just those barren bricks into re, uh, valuable resources. Now, fortunately we do have a silver bullet in our fight against climate change and biodiversity crisis. We can, we can fight both of these things at the same time. And that is that conservation works. Nature is extremely resilient, but we've got to give her a chance. Few examples. This is the Natchusa grasslands, 3,800 acres in Illinois. There are uh, 730 native plant species that are living there now. Uh, 180 species of birds have been recorded there. It wasn't long ago that it was a cornfield. So we can revive these systems if we get serious about it. This is what's happened at uh, our house right here in Oxford, Pennsylvania, where my wife Cindy and I live. We have 10 acres of a farm that was was uh, sold off uh, back in the year 2000 in 10 acre lots. It had been mowed for hay uh, before they, they sold it off. And when you mow for hay, I, we live in Southeast Pennsylvania. What you're really mowing is the rootstocks of all the invasive plants that are out there. So multiflora rose and oriental bittersweet and Japanese honeysuckle and bush honeysuckle and miscanthus and, and uh, porcelain berry, all those things are being mowed. And when you stop mowing, that's what comes back. So this is what our property looked like, 10 acres of Asian vines uh, and, and shrubs that have escaped from our garden, from our gardens. So our job was to uh, remove this. And it's not that hard, especially if you get your wife to do it. That's Cindy out there working, working hard. I shouldn't minimize uh, it. Uh, it. It is a lot of work, uh, but you can do it. Cindy did it practically alone. And that's what our property looks like taken from the same perspective uh, today because we put uh, some of the plants back, not all of them still working on it. Uh, but my research has shown that if you know the number of species of moths in your local food web, you have a good index of how productive that food web is and how stable that food web is. So for the last six years, I've been taking pictures of moths at our house and I'm up to 1,243 species of moths that have come back to this piece of, of the earth because we put the plants back. Uh, these are interesting things, things like the chinkapin leaf miner, the skullcap skeletonizer, the neighbor, they've got great names, the little devil, the horrid zaley, the forgotten frigid owlet, the scallop sallow, the obtuse yellow, the explicit arches, the snowy shouldered aclaris, the great flamigid, the morbid owlet, the pink shaded fern moth, the feeble grass moth, the scribbler, lemon plagotus, the showy emerald, the green marvel, Harris's three spot, the old wife underwing, the eyed pectes, the tufted bird dropping moth. Who wouldn't want the tufted bird dropping moth at their house? The hog sphinx, beautiful creature. 
This is one of my favorite, the spun glass caterpillar uh, and hundreds more species of, of uh, moths and their caterpillars have come back to the plants on our property because we put those plants there. They wouldn't be here if we didn't have them. And when I tell that story, people say, well, how come you have any plants at all? How come those caterpillars haven't eaten all the plants on your property? Because we also have the things that eat those caterpillars, uh, like, like birds. We've got 62 species of birds that have bred on our property. We've recorded them, and they eat hundreds of caterpillars a day, thousands of caterpillars to get one nest of those birds to the point where they, they fledge. Uh, we also have lots of insect predators out there. We've got ambush bugs. We've got assassin bugs. We've got predatory stink bugs. Here's one that sat next to this aggregation of milkweed tussock moth, and it ate one a day, uh, and there were fewer by the time they matured. Lots of, of uh, hymenopteran parasitoids. These are wasps that lay their eggs in caterpillars. Um, lots, you know, hundreds of species of them. Uh, and this is a result. This is a Pandora sphinx uh, caterpillar where the, the um, parasitoids, it's a, a briconid, it's a family of, of parasitic wasps, have already eaten out the insides of this, this creature. Then they tunnel through its, its exoskeleton. They spin a cocoon. People think those are eggs, but that's really the cocoon of those parasitoids. And these guys have already emerged. So this one caterpillar produced, what, I don't know, 20, 30 uh, parasitoids. Very common on our property. And then we also have predatory wasp. Uh, so this, this wasp has stung this caterpillar. Uh, so it's paralyzed. It's not uh, dead. Then it flies off, puts it in its nest, and it lays an egg on it. That is nature's form of refrigeration. If it had killed the caterpillar, the caterpillar would rot before that egg even hatched, but it keeps it alive by paralyzing it. Then the, the egg of the wasp hatches and it eats the caterpillar alive. And we have vertebrates that eat lots of insects too. We have skunks, we have possums, we have raccoons, we have uh, red foxes. 25% of a fox's diet is insects. And we've got lots of amphibians too. We've got tree frogs, we've got toads, we've got salamanders, we've got ringneck snakes. These are all insect eaters and the cutest little uh, gray tree frogs that you've ever seen. They're green when they're little. And of course, lots of other things. So moving on, now that was the story of the lawn, but our lawn goals are too modest because most of the private property that's out there is not in lawn. It's in woodlots, cropland, or rangeland. So we have to deal with them as well in Homegrown National Park. As a matter of fact, there are 406 million acres in woodlots that are managed by private citizens, not logging companies, uh, just in the U.S. alone. And how they are managed is going to determine their biodiversity value. And by managed, I mean these, these areas are, are logged. But how do we do that? And how do we maintain the invasive species load? Well, there are organizations now uh, that... Uh, are dedicated to sustainable forestry, such as the Foundation for Sustainable Forests in Western Pennsylvania. We'll tell you exactly how you can manage your woodlot. There's two kinds of, of woodlot management, high-grade harvesting and worst-first managing. High-grade harvesting, where you take the very best trees <clears throat> and then you leave the rest, that provides you a good harvest once, uh, and then you got to wait about 80 years for another one. Worst first selection leaves the best trees. You take smaller, more frequent harvests, uh, and that leads to uh, sustained yields over time indefinitely. You never actually destroy the forest. But we also have to manage the invasive species that are in our woodlots, and most of them are choked with invasive species, taking up to a third of the vegetation with plants uh, largely from Asia. Uh, and in order to manage our invasive species, we have to manage our, our deer. We have uh, overabundance of deer uh, across the U.S., particularly in the East. They're really wreaking havoc. havoc. These guys like native plants just like insects do, and they leave the non-natives alone. So it changes the competitive value or the competitive uh, edge that um, the non-natives have. Everybody thinks the non-natives are such competitive plants. Uh, they're just like any other plant. If you cage out the deer... Uh, the, it turns out our native plants are, are much uh, better competitors than we thought. You know, when the baby oak tree pops its head above the, the land there, if it's eaten by a deer, it doesn't get a chance to compete very well. This is what it looks like when you have deer, no understory there, no replacement for a forest. And this is what it looks like when you keep them out. Uh, this is a shot. I was in the Great Smoky Mountains this spring. 
that's what a healthy forest looks like. That's understory. And these understory plants are largely young uh, overstory trees. They are canopy trees waiting for a chance to, to grow up. And I was interested, how come, uh, how come it looks like this? Why aren't the deer uh, over browsing the Smoky Mountains? Uh, I thought they had a really neat management plan. They said, we don't, we don't manage at all. Um, and we don't have too many deer. Why don't we have too many deer? Uh, well, they do have black bears, they have uh, bobcats, and they have coyotes, and those three working together. They don't have wolves, that would help a lot, but those three working together are enough to keep the deer populations below the point where they destroy the forest. There's another serious downside to, to deer overabundance, and that, of course, is Lyme disease. We have Lyme disease because the deer are an important component of the, the uh, black-legged tick, the deer tick uh, life cycle. Um, they actually mate on, on deer. So um, if you have an abundance of deer, you're going to have Lyme disease. How do we control deer? We can't spend a lot of time on this, but the predators will work if we put them back. We can hire sharpshooters, very expensive. They'll come in, they'll shoot maybe half the deer, and it sounds like a lot, but it's never enough. And you got to have them back and back and back. Uh, or uh, Bern Blossy at, at uh, Cornell is proposing market hunting, where you you actually uh, pay people for every deer that they they uh, harvest. Um, and, you know, no no season, we're trying to control the deer numbers. So this is probably the one that's going to work if we ever get serious about deer control. What do you do in the meantime? I put a cage around the, the plants that I want to keep. Um, so any, any uh, oak tree, for example, that I want to plant on my property has got to be caged or it'll be killed. Cropland, got a lot of area in cropland, 410 million acres uh, of the U.S. are now in some form of cropland. That's the light green area here. Uh, and you might think, well, there's nothing we can do to crops to increase bio its biodiversity value, but that is not true. There's a lot of things we can do. We can manage the roadsides properly. We can put back hedgerows any place uh, that's possible to do that. Add prairie strips and minimize our use of neonicotinoid insecticides. Um, the reason we have lost the monarch, the reason it is now red listed, the reason I've only seen two this entire summer is because we have taken away the area where those those the milkweeds and the asters and the goldenrod and all the things that supported monarch used to be. We called them weeds. We sprayed Roundup right up to the road and we replaced it with lawn. This is now the the uh, agricultural ethic across the country, which means we've and that's why we've got a, a loss of native bees as well. We've replaced productive uh, tiny little ecosystems on thousands and thousands and thousands of miles of roadsides in our agricultural areas with lawn that has to be mowed. But we can put it back. Uh, people are putting it back. Uh, Iowa is working very hard on putting uh, prairie ecosystems back along roadsides. Uh, and and um, if we do that, we can save the monarch. If we don't do that, we will not save the monarch. Put our hedgerows back. We took out hedgerows because they interfered with large machinery, uh, and then we just went crazy about it. We took out hedgerows that that uh, didn't need to be removed. But not only should we take them, put them back, we need to make sure that they are comprised of native species. We did a study uh, at the University of Delaware comparing the caterpillar populations in hedgerows that are invaded by non-native plants. So here's autumn olive and multiflora rose and lots of other things and compared it with hedgerows that are not invaded by uh, Asian plants and found that when they're invaded, they supported 68 or they reduced caterpillar populations by 68%. The number of species, the abundance of those caterpillars by 91%, and they reduced the biomass of those caterpillars, the actual weight, the actual amount of energy in those, those hedgerows by 96%. In other words, when you allow your hedgerows to be invaded by non-native plants, you reduce the amount of bird food by 96%. Prairie strips, uh, wonderful idea. Put, put these prairie strips right through the corn, right through the soybeans, um, and put them perpendicular to the flow of water off the landscape. So they intercept uh, soil, the topsoil that we're losing from our farmland and also all the pollutants that we're adding to our watershed. So not only is it a wonderful place for those pollinators we're trying to support, uh, but it reduces topsoil loss by 95%, reduces water pollution by 90%, um, and you get USDA CRP funding, you get support. The, the grower is not losing any productivity at all, he's actually paid to do this. It's a win-win for everybody. Then finally, minimizing uh, neonicotinoid uh, um, insecticides that are 7,000 times more toxic to insects than DDT was. That's the pink stuff that's on the seeds that you plant. Seed coatings, 
Only 5% of that product is taken up by the plant. The other 95% washes off into the watershed or blows away on dust uh, where it's, it's extremely uh, stable, stays there for a long, long time. What's interesting is we're using it preventively. In other words, whether or not you have an insect problem, we're loading the landscape with neonicotinoid seed coatings. Uh, and when you compare yield in a, a crop where you've used seed coatings with yield in that same crop where you don't use seed coatings, you don't get any increase in yield. We're using them for nothing. Rangeland. Uh, most of the land is actually in raised land. Uh, 770 million acres uh, of the U.S. is in rangeland. That's four and a half times the size of Texas dedicated to cattle. Uh, but it can be, you know, we can graze our, our grasslands productively. All grasslands co-evolved with, with grazers. Um, so uh, we've, we've gotten rid of the bison, but we can put um, cattle there. Uh, and we can do it sustainably. This is a, an experimental range in Nebraska. All the yellow you see here, those are sunflowers. These are cattle, they're not bison. Uh, so if you, if you don't overgraze, uh, you can have a productive landscape. Put the beavers back. You know, the terrible problem with, with rangeland um, degradation, particularly in the Southwest, has come from, not necessarily from overgrazing, they do overgraze, but it's really come from eliminating the beavers. When you eliminate beavers, all of the waterways become channelized, uh, which these deep cuts in size into the, uh, into the landscape lowers the water table. Um, now, beavers used to dam this, and the water table was right up here, which made marshland, and uh, it kept uh, a lot more water on the landscape. Um, so if you, if you uh, put in either the beavers back to raise that water table, um, or put beaver analog dams in there. You, we essentially build beaver dams ourselves. Uh, we can restore a lot of those wetlands. But finally, you have to keep the cows out of those wetlands, out of the, the streams themselves, where they eat the willows and they eat the cottonwoods, and those are the major supporters of biodiversity in our rangelands. Okay, there's something that's common to each one of these conservation approaches. Uh, and that is whether or not they, they work, whether or not they succeed depends on decisions that you and I make. They become a, not a scientific problem, but a sociological problem. Uh, I had a student a few years ago who wrote this on a, on a test. While conservationists claim to be managing species and habitats, what we are really managing is people. Uh, and that is so true. So we really are talking about changing the culture at Homegrown National Park. We want to change it from an adversarial relationship with nature we've, we've had for so long to a collaborative one. We have to work with nature if we're going to persist on this planet. And the real question is, can we do this? And I say, of course we can do it. You don't have to save biodiversity for a living, but you can save it where you live. And if you do, it empowers you. You know, so many people right now are concerned about what's happening on the planet, but they feel powerless. What can one person do? Well, one person can shrink the lawn. One person can modify your light system. One person can add a pollinator garden, remove invasive plants from your property, add those keystone uh, plants, fire your mosquito fogger, join homegrown national park. Lots of things a single person can do and totally turn around the ecological productivity of their, of their property and then enhance their local ecosystem instead of continuing to degrade it. And it also shrinks the problem down to something that's manageable for each one of us. Don't think about the entire planet's problems. You get depressed. Just think about the piece of the planet that you can influence. If you own property, it's obvious. That's where you start. If you don't own property, help somebody who does. Volunteer for a land conservancy, park or preserve. They're all understaffed. They're all underfunded. They'll love you as a volunteer. So we hope that Homegrown National Park will provide the motivation and the guidance for millions of us, millions of us to tackle these conservation challenges. Whether or not we do so today is going to determine nature's fate in the future and then ultimately our own. So please get on the map. Thanks very much. Wow, that was awesome. Thanks, Doug. You really made my job easy today. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, now it's your turn. You've got to spread this nationwide. So, <laughs> uh, We will definitely do that. And um, one of the things as you're cl closing out there with, you know, logging on and uh, getting on the site, are there more things to do beyond just um, tagging your property when you uh, when you get onto homegrown national parks? Like, should you identify what types of uh, restorations you've done or uh, what wildlife you're spotting, those kinds of things? That's, 
that's down the road. Um, okay. That requires a, a better web system than we have. Actually, building that map is really expensive. Yeah. <laughs> so these are features that we do want to add. Okay. Um, uh, and we've recently switched to a, a, a new IT company. Um, but that's where most of the money of, of Hunger and Asher Park goes. And it's all from, you know, it's, it's donations. So we're restricted in what we can do with this map. But yes, we want not just to record the acreage, uh, but the type of plant. Um, and we also want to record the acreage uh, of, of invasives that is is removed. Great. And you actually led me right into one of my other questions that came up as you were talking. You, you showed the um, the list of keystone plants. Is there a companion list of top invasive species that should be the key targets for people to get rid of? You know, that changes as you move around the country. Um, we do not have a county by county list of invasive species. That's a good idea. Uh, you can get it. You can Google invasives in whatever your county is, and it'll pop up right away. But we don't have a central site for that. Not, not a bad idea. None of the conservancy sites or anything have done such a, a database? They do it locally, but nobody's done it nationally that I know of. Okay. Yeah, because I've been um, single-handedly going after all the invasives around me, and I want to make sure I'm getting all the right ones. Well, it's hard to get a wrong one, but <laughs> <laughs> that's true. And then the um, one other thing that came up, uh, I had a question about the mosquito dunks. Is there a time of year that's the best uh, to try that approach? Well, you want to do it when you've got the most mosquitoes. So uh, actually right now, this time of year, uh, August and September, when you have peak mosquito populations, pretty much everywhere in the country. Um, doing it early in the season, uh, where I live, there's just very few mosquitoes. It's, you know, this is, it's cheap. Uh, so if you do it and there's no mosquitoes around, that's, that's okay. Um, but you really want to do it by, by the end of June, you want to have it up and going so that you keep the mosquito populations low. Um, it works really well when you have a drought because you're creating the only water source out there and the mosquitoes uh, are drawn right to it. So if you have a lot of rain and there's, and there's, you know, breeding sites all over the place, it's a little bit tougher, but um, so again, really if everybody did it, it would, it would help a lot. So yeah, normally uh, we end our talk with um, what can people do to help you out? Um, you've already laid out, you know, call to action number one is get on the map. Um, what else can people do? Are you, do you have a, um, a donation site or any other ways to help keep your work going? Yeah, there is a donation button on on Hunger National Park site. Uh, it is the only way that that uh, we exist because we don't we don't charge. And we don't charge for a reason. We don't want to pull people away from their existing conservation organizations. We're not trying to compete for membership. We want everybody who's interested in conservation, which needs to be everybody, um, to engage. And the best way to do that is make it make it free. Uh, so yeah, donations. Uh, are, we we live and breathe off of donations. Uh, another great thing is to is to create a success, a successful model in your neighborhood. Um, you know, right now there's this this um, opinion, and it's you know it's an urban legend that if you use native plants, you're you're going to lower property values, and your your property will be ugly, and and you know everybody will hate you. Uh, <laughs> now you know landscaping. Landscape design works for native plants as well as non-native plants. I showed you the picture of Pam Carlson's house. It's beautiful. I mean, it's crazy that it has to be ugly if they're native plants. It doesn't. You can make an ugly house with native plants. You can also make an ugly, ugly yard with non-native plants. So, um, and that's one of the reasons we say, I don't say get rid of the lawn. I say reduce the area. The lawn you keep is going to be manicured. It's going to fit right in with our, our, uh, you know, lawn is a status symbol. You don't need to put any products on it. You don't need insecticides. You don't need fertilizer. Just mow it frequently. Um, it's not going to be the area that supports biodiversity, but it will be the area that convinces your neighbor that you understand what, what the, the current culture is and you're part of it. You're not a rebel against it. Line your sidewalk or your, your uh, driveway with it. The new beds you put in, you line that with with lawn. Those are the paths that you will use to walk around your property. So lawn plays a valuable role in your landscape. It's the best plant to walk on without killing it. So so we want to use it that way and advertise the fact that we're we're not being rebels here. We're just trying to live sustainably with the ecosystems that support us. 
And I like that goal of reducing it by half, not wipe it out entirely and replace it with uh, wild scraggly uh, natives, but uh, yeah. by half. So you've still got a lawn, but you've got the edges where, um, where the food sources can live. Well, that alone is an ambitious uh, <laughs> goal, but we'll, we'll start with half. <laughs> awesome. Great. Well, um, thanks so much for your time. Really uh, looking forward to helping spread the word. I've already got some ideas of local green teams and other folks that I'm, I'm going to try to challenge to get into a uh, competition with each other to see who can uh, get the most onto the map. And I think it'd be a, a really uh, fun project. I didn't mention that the states are color coded based on the number of people and the acreage that that uh, have been signed up to homegrown national parks. So you can see where your state is in this this national competition. A lot of people are into competitions. So, <laughs> right. and then when you zoom into the state level, you can see by county too, right? Or just find the people in the area. You can see the people that have signed up. Yeah, not the real names or addresses, but right. you know, the fireflies light up, so you can see. Uh, if your neighbors are, are on board as well. Awesome. Well, thanks again. And I just want to remind everybody that, uh, you know, it's a team effort here. And like everything that we always talk about on sustainability now, um, working together, we can shape a world that works. Thanks again, Doug. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to Sustainability Now. Visit sustainabilitynow.global to find resources related to today's program. While you're there, pledge your support by making a contribution to help us shape a world that works. And remember to subscribe, share, and follow us on social media.